Good morning to everybody. My name is Jörg Bergson. I'm director of one of the two directors of the FAS office, that's the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung office here in Budapest. And I'm welcoming you very much this morning um, here at the Institute of Political History, which is our cooperation partner on this. And I thank you very much for all the work that you have put into organizing this conference. In particular, thanks goes to Art Brandt, who put many hours into the organization of this event, which, I must be frank, is confusing to you. Um, and, but maybe that's symbolic for the topic of Marxism, post-Marxism today, in, in, uh, in particular with the perspective of Central Eastern Europe. And I'm telling you why it is confusing to me. Because we closed the registration for this event when we had 130 people registering and there were so many more pouring in that we said, okay, it's impossible in these rooms, unfortunately we cannot accept any more people. Now there's plenty of space. And maybe this is symbolic. Maybe it's symbolic for the situation we are in. Uh, for us as FES, we are proud and happy to organize actually around the world this year uh, many, many, many events uh, on the occasion of Karl Marx's 200th birthday. You see here this, this hashtag and website and so on where, where some of those things are being collected. And FES does this. Well, one reason is we are the custodians of, 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 a, of a large part of Marx's uh, inheritance. We are, we are running the Karl Marx House in Spiel. That's, that's um, a task that has been put to us. But more importantly, because the FES and the Social Democratic Party of Germany that we are linked to would probably not be in existence if there hadn't been Karl Marx. So in a, in a, in a very strong way, Marx and his ideas are the foundation of our existence and of a long and very, very strong and vibrant political history in Western Europe as well as in Central Eastern Europe, although it's spelled out differently. So 200 years after Marx's birth, that's probably a very good idea, a very good point in time to sit back and reflect on uh, what does Marx theory, what does post martian theory have to tell us for today's, to understand and politically influence today's world and current affairs. It is not only 200 years after Marx's birth, it's also about 30 years after the prematurely proclaimed end of history. Um, and it's 10 years, more, more than 10 years after the a global financial and economic crisis, which reminded some people <coughs> that once there was, once there were other philosophies and theories around than just uh, liberal economic theories, and we are now. This is difficult to put a to put a year, a number of years. But what we do see is, at least since 2008 and the crisis, what we see is an emergence and continuous strengthening of extremist, in particular right-wing populist and extremist ideas uh, throughout all our countries. Uh, a different strength, a different speed, but there is this tendency and we believe also this is an indication, uh, gives, gives us enough reason to, as I said in the beginning, sit back and reflect on political theory, on uh, and on what Marx and those who came after Marx can today tell us in order to understand, uh, first of all, understand dynamics better, and secondly, then politically influence and control. So we are very much looking forward uh, to this conference, which is the second this year in this cooperation. We had one uh, end of May together. Um, this one today wants to put particular focus on Central Eastern European perspectives. Um, 
I'm very much eager to learn from you, to learn from all the brain power collected here. And I'm also curious as to whether the room will still fill up, whether we have been trolled <laughs> by somebody, or what is behind this very awkward and very unusual imbalance in registrations on the one hand and the actual um, uh, the people here in the room on the other. But hopefully, it will still fill up. Um, yeah, I'm handing over to you now. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a good time. Thank you very much. Here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to welcome such a distinguished and colorful audience here at the Institute of Political History. I wrote in advance, but actually I'm just as confused as the background because of this discrepancy between enthusiastic registration and somewhat lukewarm present. Nevertheless, I must admit that at least in terms of the registration, it was somewhat uncommon, mainly because the Institute conducts most of its activities in Hungarian. But it was certainly not unjustified to see that the response we got after we had announced this event was not just due to its accessibility for the international community here in the United States. Neither was it entirely the result of cooperation with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, whose generous support I would like to thank here. I do think it was the team of this conference that made people announce coming here, Karl Marx and Central and Eastern. It is not unnatural for people like Karl Marx to remain in the focus of attention for a long time after they have passed away. Intellectuals <coughs> who live as long as Marx and has such an afterlife, but most importantly, whose voluminous book reflected upon practically everything of his age, from the tiniest to the broadest, can rarely avoid being invoked throughout the next century. Not necessarily, not necessarily always in a positive context. Marx had and has today many faces, probably even personal, ranging from the conscious forerunner of totalitarianism to the holder of the ultimate truth regarding the unavoidable exploitative nature and collapse of capitalism. These cannot be true simultaneously, but all of them has borne out of one impression or conviction. Karl Marx was one of the few truly defining intellectuals of modernity, one whose ideas define social movement impacted upon politics and were used to legitimate even the horrors of dictators. He was always criticized, attacked, often accused of instigating violence, undermining order. Exactly because he was not just analyzing society and but never made a secret of his intention to use this knowledge for change. He was, and this is part of the controversies around his ideas, undoubtedly a radical. But before hastily condemning this radicalism in demanding a new society instead of the capitalism he observed from its first pants throughout its first flourishing, one should note that radicalism was quite common for most of the new ideas emerging out of the contradictions of the 19th century. It was more the result of the pace and depth of changes that raised down quickly an ancient regime that was much easier to understand than the emerging new social realities in a few and simple concepts, then it was the result of some personal attitude or lust for destruction. The radical reconfiguration of society never stopped since its inception until today, seemed and seemed to require bold ideas for bringing new stability and humanizing the world based on inhuman condition. Not one, not one of the great ideologies of modernity could have avoided becoming radical in rejecting the old order one way or another, be it liberalism's terms towards social rights and politics of identity, and originally emancipative nationalism's detour to radical na national socialism, or even Christian democracy's embracing of individual human rights and liberal political order. Today, ironically, self type conservatives seem to be the most radical of our whole ideology, true social engineers in the current prosperian sense, who advocate erasing the human history of at least 100 years or even more, decomposing society as it exists now, and returning to an age that never was, and what represents for them the rejection of alignment. At the Institute, this conference is part and crowning event of a 20 months long commemorative year. We were and are not alone in the world 
in Europe and in its central and eastern countries with this end data. You may ask, if Marx is so important for us, why did I dwell so much on his rivals and even on his critics? The reason is unfortunate, and I feel not really comfortable to tackle it. But recent development, for example, harassment of a conference on Marx in Poland, ban on a legitimate social science discipline without consulting the bodies who are legally entitled to have the ultimate say on whether the discipline is sound in academic terms in Hungary, or even the attacks on the Academy of Sciences and its research institutes in Hungary and Slovakia signal a broader pattern of curtailing academic freedom. This very institute is under attack, even though, for a superficial observer, it is rather a ridiculous attempt. The government insists in a court case that our forced eviction will remedy trial. But within the context of a crumbling pool of law, it is perhaps not the best strategy not to take this seriously. Academic freedom is, however, not something exquisite, special, significant for and affecting only a few people living in ivory tower. Academic freedom is freedom of expression. We all know well that curtailing academic freedom in the name of a sole truth cannot lead to a better society. Change grows out of argument, discussion, debate, even forceful and passionate clash of ideas that requires the freedom to speak out and the freedom to argue. We have learned it, if not otherwise, from the sorrowful history of official Marxism that subdued creative force. And with it, we have learned that knowledge in a democracy be it from natural sciences or from the social sciences, is always necessarily politics too. Because in free and democratic society, finally everything falls within the scope of popular sovereignty and change is only possible through the popular will. If someone accuses us of making politics instead of restraining ourselves to simply communicating our ideas with a closed academic body, we should not fear to add it. Yes. We, scholars, researchers, intellectuals, not only want to understand the world around us, for the new, new neural rewards such an accomplishment will induce in our brain. We want to change it. The real reward is always a better, more harmonious, and more human society. Thank you very much.